the luminous being, touched me in some undefined part of myself, and my body experienced such an exquisite, indescribable warmth and well-being that it was as if the touch had made me explode. I became transfixed. I couldn't feel my feet or my legs or any part of my body, yet something was sustaining me erect. I have no idea how long I stayed in that position. In the meantime, the luminous coyote and the hilltop where I stood melted away. I had no thoughts or feelings. Everything had been turned off, and I was floating freely. Suddenly I felt that my body had been struck, and then it became enveloped by something that kindled me. I became aware that the sun was shining on me. I could vaguely distinguish a distant range of mountains towards the west. The sun was almost over the horizon. I was looking directly into it, and then I saw the lines of the world. I actually perceived the most extraordinary profusion of fluorescent white lines which crisscrossed everything around me. For a moment, I thought that I was perhaps experiencing sunlight as it was being refracted by my eyelashes. I blinked and looked again. The lines were constant and were superimposed on or were coming through everything in the surroundings. I turned around and examined an extraordinarily new world. The lines were visible and steady, even if I looked away from the sun. I stayed on the hilltop in a state of ecstasy for what appeared to be an endless time. Yet the whole event may have lasted only a few minutes, perhaps only as long as the sun shone before it reached the horizon. But to me, it seemed an endless time. I felt something warm and soothing, oozing out of the world and out of my own body. I knew I had discovered a secret. It was so simple. I experienced an unknown flood of feelings. Never in my life had I had such a divine euphoria, such peace, such an encompassing grasp. And yet I couldn't put the discovered secret into words or even into thoughts. But my body knew it. Then I either fell asleep or I fainted. When I again became aware of myself, I was lying on the rocks. I stood up. The world was as I had always seen it. It was getting dark, and I automatically started on my way back to my car. Don Juan was alone in the house when I arrived the next morning. I asked him about Don Genaro, and he said that he was somewhere in the vicinity running an errand. I immediately began to narrate to him the extraordinary experiences I had had. He listened with obvious interest. You have simply stopped the world, he commented after I had finished my account. We remained silent for a moment, and then Don Juan said that I had to thank Don Genaro for helping me. He seemed to be unusually pleased with me. He patted my back repeatedly and chuckled. But it's inconceivable that a coyote could talk, I said. It wasn't talk, Don Juan replied. What was it, then? Your body understood for the first time. But you failed to recognize that it wasn't a coyote to begin with and that it certainly wasn't talking the way you and I talk. But the coyote really talked, Don Juan. Now, look who's talking like an idiot. After all these years of learning, you should know better. Yesterday, you stopped the world, and you might have even seen. A magical being told you something, and your body was capable of understanding it, because the world had collapsed. The world was like it is today, Don Juan. No, it wasn't. Today the coyotes don't tell you anything, and you can't see the lines of the world. Yesterday, you did all that simply because something had stopped in you. What was the thing that stopped in me? What stopped inside you yesterday was what people have been telling you the world is like. You see, people tell us 
from the time we are born that the world is such and such and so and so. And naturally, we have no choice but to see the world the way people have been telling us it is. We looked at each other. Yesterday, the world became as sorcerers tell you it is, he went on. In that world, coyotes talk, and so do deer, as I once told you, and so do rattlesnakes, and trees, and all other living beings. But what I want you to learn is seeing. Perhaps you know now that seeing happens only when one sneaks between the worlds, the world of ordinary people and the world of sorcerers. You are now smack in the middle point between the two. Yesterday, you believed the coyote talked to you. Any sorcerer who doesn't see would believe the same, but one who sees knows that to believe that is to be pinned down in the realm of sorcerers. By the same token, not to believe that coyote's talk is to be pinned down in the realm of ordinary men. Do you mean, Don Juan, that neither the world of ordinary men nor the world of sorcerers is real? They are real worlds. They could act upon you. For example, you could have asked that coyote about anything you wanted to know, and it would have been compelled to give you an answer. The only sad part is that coyotes aren't reliable. They're tricksters. It's your fate not to have a dependable animal companion. Don Juan explained that the coyote was going to be my companion for life, and that in the world of sorcerers to have a coyote friend was not a desirable state of affairs. He said that it would have been ideal for me to have talked to a rattlesnake, since they were stupendous companions. If I were you, he added, I would never trust a coyote. But you are different, and you may even become a coyote sorcerer. What is a coyote sorcerer? One who draws a lot of things from his coyote brothers. I wanted to keep on asking questions, but he made a gesture to stop me. You've seen the lines of the world, he said. You've seen a luminous being. You're now almost ready to meet the ally. Of course, you know that the man you saw in the bushes was the ally. You heard its roar like the sound of a jet plane. He'll be waiting for you at the edge of a plane, a plane I'll take you to myself. We were quiet for a long time. Don Juan had his hands clasped over his stomach. His thumbs moved almost imperceptibly. Genaro will also have to go with us to that valley, he said all of a sudden. He's the one who's helped you to stop the world. Don Juan looked at me with piercing eyes. I'll tell you one more thing, he said, and laughed. It really does matter now. Genaro never moved your car from the world of ordinary men the other day. He simply forced you to look at the world like sorcerers do, and your car wasn't in that world. Genaro wanted to soften your certainty. His clowning told your body about the absurdity of trying to understand everything, and when he flew his kite, you almost saw. You found your car, and you were in both worlds. The reason we nearly split our guts laughing was because... You really thought you were driving us back from where you thought you'd found your car. But how did he force me to see the world as sorcerers do? I was with him. We both know that world. Once one knows that world, all one needs to bring it about is to use that extra ring of power. I've told you sorcerers have. Genaro can do that as easily as snapping his fingers. He kept you busy turning over rocks in order to distract your thoughts and allow your body to see. I told him that the events of the last three days had done some irreparable damage to my idea of the world. I said that during the ten years I'd been associated with him, 
I had never been so moved, not even during the times I'd ingested psychotropic plants. Power plants are only an aid, Don Juan said. The real thing is when the body realizes that it can see. Only then is one capable of knowing that the world we look at every day is only a description. My intent has been to show you that. Unfortunately, you have very little time left before the ally tackles you. Does the ally have to tackle me? There's no way to avoid it. In order to see, one must learn the way sorcerers look at the world, and thus the ally has to be summoned. And once that's done, it comes. Couldn't you have taught me to see without summoning the ally? No. In order to see, one must learn to look at the world in some other fashion. And the only other fashion I know is the way of a sorcerer.